Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 39 on time series modeling and forecasting. In uh, ALMA processes, we mainly study how the mean of the process has evolved. In fact, uh, if the process is uh, stationary, then the mean of the process is constant. But if, if you consider the conditional mean, then it depends upon the past observations, conditional mean given the past information. For example, if you consider AR1 process yt equal to phi yt minus 1 plus ut, then expected value of yt given the past observation say y t minus 1, y t minus 2, so on, is equal to phi y t minus 1. So, it tells you how these conditional expectations have evolved. This process tells you about the evolution of conditional expectations or conditional means. Now, the same thing one may think of the variances also. For a stationary process, the variance is constant, but one may be interested in how the variance has evolved. This uh, conditional variance may vary with time. Now, one phenomena which has been often observed in time series is that if there is a big change, a large change, it is normally followed by a large change. That change may be increase or decrease, may be positive or negative, but usually it is followed by several shocks of several large changes. And this kind of behavior often leads to some kind of clusters in variability. In some portions of the time series, you find a lot of variability. If there is a normal change, it is usually followed by a normal change. But if the magnitude is large, then it is usually followed by a large change. That large change may be in the same direction or in the opposite direction. Now, this kind of volatile behavior may be of interest to many applied workers, may be for many economists or for many people who are working in the financial market. Say, for example, if you know that the share prices have this kind of volatile behavior, then you can take advantage of this kind of volatile behavior or you may lose a lot of money because of this kind of volatile behavior. If you enter the market at the right time, if you have some idea of high, how this volatile behavior is going to work, then you can gain a lot. And if you do not have any idea, if you, you are not analyzing this volatile behavior properly, then you may lose 
a lot of money. So, people may be interested in this kind of volatile behavior of the time series. In this lecture, I am going to consider some stochastic volatility models. In particular, I will consider arc and garc models. In this lecture, I will consider arc models. In the next lec lecture, garc models. So, we come to arc and garc models. Then, ARIMA models describe the mean development of time series. Then, optimal forecast is the conditional mean of the model, which mi minimizes the forecast error variance. Again, the unconditional variances are time invariant. They are constant, do not vary with time. But the conditional variances and covariances often depend on the magnitude of past shocks and past variability. Just like this conditional mean of the model, this conditional mean depends upon the past observations and the past shocks. So, the conditional variance is also a, may depend upon the magnitude of the past shocks and past variability. Then in modern economic theory, increasing role of risk and uncertainty considerations makes the modeling of time varying vari variances and covariances crucial. So, the study of uh, changes in model variability may be of interest to many economists or many people who are working in risk analysis or financial market. Now, modeling and understanding nature of temporal dependence of variances is important for many issues in macroeconomics and finance. So, how the variances change given the past shocks or given the past variances. This kind of dependence may be of interest in many fields. And uh, if you are estimating the forecast error, or forecast error uncertainty, then a much more accurate estimate of the forecast error uncertainty is possible by conditioning on the current information set. So, if you know that any large changes lead to large changes in next period also. So, if there is a lot of variability, then it is going to lead to a lot of variability in the next period also. Then accordingly, you may modify the forecast error uncertainty. Then financial data show volatile behavior, often these data show volatile behavior. Then the risk associated with an asset or investment is crucial factor in modeling financial data. And what measures that risk? Measure of risk associated with asset is asset volatility. How much volatile behavior the asset price has? or investment has. Now, let us take uh, some examples of real data set which show volatile behavior. 
Now, this is uh, the graph of VIX historical price data from 3 1 2006 to 14 12 2007. Then you observe that uh, here the time series is behaving normally, then there is a sudden increase and after that it is followed by a lot of changes then again there is a certain increase, then you get a big decrease and it is followed by many changes or at this point you can observe the volatile behavior. So, there is an increase, then suddenly the time series is decreasing, again it increases, decreases with big magnitude and ultimately it reaches here. So, this period is called built up, the volatile behavior is building up. Then this is the volatility event. Then you have normalization deflection, it is going towards the normal situation. So, this kind of behavior of the time series leads to many variability clusters. Here you get a cluster of variability, again you have a small cluster here, here you have a big cluster. Then this is the time series of daily changes in Wilshire 5000 stock index. It is a time series of daily data from 49-2016 to 49-2021. So, this is very recent data. Then uh, you observe that the means here time series is behaving normally, then you have some volatile period here and then you have a big volatile period here. Then we have time series of South African real gross domestic product. So, this GTP data also shows a lot of volatile behavior here. Now, this is a statement given by Mendel Roth, large changes tend to be followed by large changes of either sign. If there is a large increase, then in the next period you may have a large increase or large decrease, it may be of either sign and small changes tend to be followed by small changes. And if your time series has this kind of behavior, then it is going to form different clusters of variability. Whenever there is a large change, you get a cluster, you get lot of changes lot of volatile behavior in the time series, lot of changes in both the directions, increases, decreases, then increases etcetera. So, you get different clusters. Then volatility has these properties, there exist volatility clusters that is volatility is high for certain time periods and low for other periods. We have considered different examples here. It is low for some of these periods, then it is high for this period. So, you get this kind of volatility clusters or in this example also you have different clusters. Then volatility evolves over time in a continuous manner that is volatility jumps are there. 
So, uh, it is not like that you get uh, volatility jumps everywhere, these are there. Then volatility is often stationary and does not diverge to infinity, it varies within fixed limits. So, although the time series has volatile behavior, that but that variability is usually stationary, it does not diverge to infinity and the variations are within fixed limits. Then volatility seems to react differently to a big price increase and a big price drop. They usually the big price drops usually having a greater impact. So, both these events have different kind of impact a big price increase has different kind of impact, a big price drop has different kind of impact. So, it may not be symmetric and usually the big price drops have greater impact. Now, this phenomena is referred to as leverage effect then the consequence of this kind of behavior is OLS is best linear unbiased estimator and consistent, but if you have volatile behavior or if the conditional variance is varying, OLS is no longer efficient say minimum variance. In particular, if you are also considering the non-linear estimators then the OLS are not efficient. Volatility model, uh, suppose y t is the log return of an asset at time index t, then series y t is either serially uncorrelated or with minor lower order serial correlations, but it is a dependent series. So, we assume that y t is serially uncorrelated or even if it is serially correlated, it has very minor lower order serial correlations. Uh, then the conditional mean and variance of y t given f t minus 1 is, f t minus 1 is the information set up to time t minus 1. So, say mu t is equal to expectation of y t given f t minus 1 and sigma square t is equal to variance of y t given f t minus 1 or this is equal to expectation of y t minus mu t square given f t minus 1. So, f t minus 1 is the information set available at time t minus 1 and f t minus 1 consists of all linear functions of the past returns or past observations you can say. Now, suppose y t follows an alma p q model, so that y t equal to mu t plus u t and expectation of y t given f t minus 1 equal to mu t is equal to phi naught plus summation i equal to 1 to p, phi i y t minus i minus summation j equal to 1 to q theta j u t minus j. So, y t follows alma p q process. Then sigma square t is equal to variance of y t given f t minus 1. Now, if you uh, obtain the unconditional mean of y t, it is 1 minus summation i equal to 1 to p phi i and this unconditional mean of y t is independent of t. So, the process is stationary and its mean does not involve t, but this conditional mean of y t given f t minus 1 involves the past observations as well as the past shocks. Then conditional 
mean of y t given f t minus 1 evolves through interaction of past observations and shocks through this model. Similarly, the conditional variances may evolve through magnitude of past shocks and past variability. So, it may be possible and if it is possible then one may be interested in modeling the these conditional variances using the information contain, contained in the magnitude of past shocks and past variances or past variability. So, the conditional heteroscedastic models are concerned with the evolution of sigma square t. Just like the ARMA processes are concerned with the evolution of conditional mean of y t given f t minus 1. Then the manner under which sigma square t evolves over time distinguishes one volatility model with another. Then if you take sigma t equal to the positive square root of sigma square t, then it is called the volatility. And volatility measures the size of the errors made in modeling returns and other financial variables. Now, these conditional heteroscedastic models can be classified into two general categories. First is we use a stochastic equation to describe sigma square t and these models are called stochastic volatility models. Usually these models involve some kind of differential equation, but uh, in this lecture we are not concerned with or we are not covering these models, the stochastic volatility models we are not uh, considering here. The second one is use an exact function to govern the evolution of sigma square t. And uh, the examples are autoregressive, conditional, heteroscedastic or uh, these are also called arc models or another form of models is generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic or GARC models. So, in ARC models actually we express the current conditional variance say sigma square t as a function of magnitude of past shocks. In fact, we take the square of past shocks. So, we express sigma square t as a linear function of square of past shocks. Whereas, in Gaia models along with the squares of past shocks, we also incorporate past variances. So, Gaia models involve both the squares of past shocks as well as the past variances. But ultimately the object, objective of both of these models is to investigate how conditional variability has evolved through the interaction of magnitude of past shocks and past variability. In ARC models, we are not considering the past variability, we are just considering the magnitude of past shocks. Whereas, in GARC models, we are considering both the magnitudes of past shocks as well as past variability. Model building, uh, how we build a volatility model for the time series. 
So, model building involves uh, these four steps. Uh, first, we specify a mean equation. Say, so, first you may test for serial dependence in data. If data are serially independent, data do not show any serial dependence, then you go to the next step. But if data so show some kind of serial dependence, then you may build some time series model. For example, ARMA model or simple moving average model or auto regressive model, etcetera. So, we built a time series model, say ARMA model, we fit the model and uh, we actually we follow this step just to remove any linear dependence. And once you fit a model, then you can again check whether your residuals are serially independent or not. So, once your residuals show insignificant serial dependence, then you proceed further. Then use the residuals to the mean equation to test for arc effects, whether these residuals have arc effect or not. And then we specify volatility model if r if arc effects are statistically significant. And we perform a joint estimation of mean and volatility equations. We estimate the mean equation as well as we estimate the volatility equation. Then we check the fitted model carefully and define it if necessary. So, these are the broad steps for building a volatility model for a time series. So, first we consider the arc or auto regressive conditional heteroscedastic model. In arc models, the shock u t is serially uncorrelated, but dependent. So, all the u t's are serially uncorrelated, but these u t's are dependent. And then this dependence of UTs can be described by a simple quadratic function of its lagged values. So, suppose we consider our M model, then our M model assumes that we write UT equal to sigma t epsilon t. And this epsilon t is a sequence of iid random variables with mean 0 and variance 1. Then we write sigma square t is equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square plus 1 plus alpha m u t minus m square. So, basically in this arc model of order m, what we are assuming? We are assuming that sigma square t, the current variance given the past information depends upon u t minus 1 square u t minus 2 square so on up to u t minus m square. 
or the magnitude of past shocks up to lag m. So, then here we assume that alpha naught is greater than 0 and alpha i is greater than or equal to 0 for all i equal to 1, 2, so on. Then alpha i satisfies some regularity conditions to ensure that the unconditional variance of u t is finite. So, some con regularity conditions must, must be satisfied. Then uh, epsilon t is assumed to follow the standard normal distribution or the standardized student t distribution or the generalized error distribution. So, usually one can think of a standard normal distribution. You assume that epsilon t follows standard normal distribution. But what happens in uh, our models? The errors are usually lactocortic means the errors have fatter tails, fatter than the normal distribution. So, often to model the errors, one prefers to use a distribution which has fatter tails than the normal distribution. And uh, two such distributions are a student t distribution and a generalized error distribution. So, people also use these two distributions as the distribution for epsilon t. Then under the arc framework, large shocks tend to be followed by another large shock. That large shock may be positive, means increasing or it may be decreasing. But uh, usually a large shock is followed by another la large shock. Now, to investigate the properties of arc models, we consider arc model of order 1, arc 1 model. So, for arc 1 model, u t is equal to sigma t epsilon t and sigma square t is equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square, alpha naught is greater than 0 and alpha 1 is greater than or equal to 0. So, if this u t minus 1 has large magnitude means u square t minus 1 is large. Now, alpha 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Suppose alpha 1 is not equal to 0, it is greater than 0, right. So, a large value of u t minus 1 square leads to, this implies a large sigma square t. means there after a large value of u t minus 1, a large value in magnitude of u t minus 1, there is a possibility of large variation. So, there is a possibility that a large shock in magnitude is followed by a another large shock. It may be in the increasing direction or in the decreasing direction, 
but since sigma square t is large, so there is a high probability that a large shock is followed by another large shock. And basically what is your objective? You want to model this phenomena. You have observed the phenomena in your time series that a large shock is followed by a large shock and you want to develop a model for this phenomena, a model which can accommodate this phenomena. So, you have used this arc model and this arc model also has this phenomena. A large shock in magnitude followed by another large shock. So, this arc model can be used as a model for this kind of volatile behavior. Now, if you take expectation of u t, then first we take the conditional expectation of u t given f t minus 1, then conditional expectation of u t given f t minus 1 is equal to sigma t expectation of epsilon t and this is ultimately equal to 0. Then variance of u t is equal to expectation of u t square. Again, in fact, uh, the result which we are using here is like this. So, suppose you have two random variables x and y. These are two random variables. Then the unconditional expectation of y is equal to suppose you take the conditional expectation of y given x first. And then you take the expectation over x here. Yeah. So, the expectation over x, the conditional expectation of y given x gives you the unconditional expectation of y. This result we have used here. So, variance of u t is equal to expectation of u t square which is equal to expectation of expectation of u t square given f t minus 1 this is the conditional expectation. Then from the R process you observe that expectation of u t square given f t minus 1 is equal to the conditional variance of u t given the information up to time t minus 1. And the conditional variance of u t given f t minus 1 is sigma square t equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square. So, you get expectation of alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square here. Again you get this equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 expectation of u t minus 1 square. And then this is equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 variance of u t because this is unconditional expectation of u t minus 1 square. And since 
u t is stationary. So, it is unconditional variance is constant. So, expectation of u t square is equal to expectation of u t minus 1 square. So, we write it equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 variance of u t. So, you get variance of u t equal to you take variance of u t towards the left hand side. So, you get 1 minus alpha 1 variance of u t equal to alpha naught and this gives you variance of u t equal to alpha naught upon 1 minus alpha 1 which is greater than or equal to 0 as long as alpha 1 lies between 0 and 1. So, you require the condition on alpha 1. alpha 1 must lie between 0 and 1. So, that the variance of u t is non negative. Remember here we mentioned that alpha i satisfies some regularity conditions to ensure that the unconditional variance of u t is finite. So, here for R 1 process that condition is alpha 1 lies between 0 and 1. Now, we obtain the fourth order fourth moment of u t and we assume that u t is fourth order stationary and then we write m 4 equal to expectation of u t to the power 4. So, we have expectation of u t to the power 4 given f t minus 1 equal to. Uh, now, now, we have taken the distribution of u t as normal distribution. So, this result is actually valid only when u t follows normal distribution. So, if u t follows normal distribution then for normal distribution you know that m 4 is equal to 3 times m 2 square. Well, m 4 is the full central moment and m 2 is the second central moment or m 2 is the variance actually. So, m 4 is equal to 3 times m 2 square. So, we write expectation of u t to the power 4 given f t minus 1 equal to 3 times expectation of u t square given f t minus 1, then we take a square of this. Then expectation of u t square given f t minus 1 is equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square then you take a square of this quantity. So, you get 3 times L square of alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square. So, and 4 is equal to expectations of u t to the power 4 equal to 3 times expectation of u alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square over square. And then this is equal to you take a square of this. So, you get alpha naught square here and since alpha naught is a constant, so is it is expectation of alpha naught square is also alpha naught square. Then you get cross product term 2 times alpha naught alpha 1 expectation of u t minus 1 square which is equal to variance of u t plus 
alpha 1 square expectation of u t minus 1 to the power 4 which is equal to m 4 and then this is equal to 3 times alpha naught square plus 2 alpha naught alpha 1 we substitute the value of variance of u t which is equal to alpha naught upon 1 minus alpha 1. Then we get plus 3 times alpha 1 square m 4. So, again you take this term towards the left hand side. So, you get m 4 1 minus 3 alpha 1 square equal to this term. And then you can simplify it and you can easily verify that m 4 is equal to 3 times alpha naught square 1 plus alpha 1 divided by 1 minus alpha 1 into 1 minus 3 alpha 1 square. and uh, mu uh, this m 4 is also greater than or equal to 0. So, this implies that not only alpha 1 lies between 0 and 1, but 3 times alpha 1 square also lies between 0 and 1. Of course, it is greater than 0. So, there is no issue, but it is less than 1 means alpha 1 square is less than 1 upon 3. Now, the unconditional kurtosis is m 4 upon variance of u t square. Actually, Kurtosis is equal to m 4 upon m 2 square and m 2 is equal to variance of u t and then we substitute the values of m 4 and variance of u t here and ultimately you get 3 times 1 minus alpha 1 square upon 1 minus 3 alpha 1 square and then you can easily verify that this quantity is greater than 3. So, the tail distribution of u t is heavier than that of a normal distribution. For normal distribution, the kurtosis is equal to 3 and uh, here the tail distribution is heavier than the normal distribution that is the shocks u t of a conditional Gaussian arc one model is more likely than a Gaussian white noise series to produce outliers. A distribution which has heavier tails means there is more probability that you get an observation in the tail area. And you are, if you are having an observation in the tail area, you may consider that observation as an outlier. For Gaussian arc 1 model, it is more likely than a Gaussian white noise series to produce an outlier. Now, weaknesses of arc models. The model depends on the squares of the previous shocks. And since you are taking the squares of previous shocks, the positive and negative shocks have the same effects on volatility. For example, arc 1 process depends upon u t minus 1 square. So, any positive change in u t minus 1 or negative change in u t minus 1 of the same magnitude have the same effect, but in practice the price of a financial asset responds differently to positive and negative shocks. If today the share price of some commodity suddenly increases, then its response for the next period may be different than 
if the share price of that particular company or uh, decreases by the same magnitude today. Then the ARC model is rather restrictive for ARC 1 model you re require the condition that alpha 1 square lies between 0 and 1 upon 3 or alpha 1 lies between 0 and 1 for the finite fourth movement or for the finite second movement. The constraint becomes complicated for higher order ARC models. Actually that is why I have not considered here ARC models of higher order. For those models, the such kind of conditions are even more complicated. Then it limits the ability of ARC models to capture excess courtesies. Then often over predict the volatility as they respond slowly to large isolated shocks to the return series. This is another problem with ARC models. These models often respond slowly and often over predict the volatility of the process. They respond slowly to large isolated shocks to the return series. That is why they over predict the volatility. Building an arc model testing for arc effect. Now, suppose u hat t is equal to y t minus mu hat t. You may get this uh, estimated residual by fitting some ARMA model to y t or by fitting some other model for y t. And then we use u hat t square to check for conditional heteroscedasticity using the following tests. Say you may consider young box test H naught is the hypothesis that the first m lacks of ACF of series u t square are 0. Then Young box is test statistics based on m sample autocorrelations is say q m equal to n into n plus 2 summation j equal to 1 to m rho hat j square divided by n minus j and this follows chi square distribution with m degrees of freedoms and then rho hat j is actually the sample auto correlation of lag j. Then LM test of eagle consider the arc model u t square equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 u t minus 1 square so on plus alpha m u t minus m square plus eta t. Uh, t varies from m plus 1 to n, eta t is error term. We are interested in testing the hypothesis that alpha i is equal to 0 for all i equal to 1 to n. Then these are the steps for the LM test. We run the ARMA or other appropriate linear time series model. And then we estimate the residuals u hat t for t equal to m plus 1 to n. So, first we fit some appropriate model and then we calculate the estimated, we estimate the residuals. And then you take the square of the residuals. So, we square the residuals, then we run the following secondary equation. You had t naught plus alpha 1, you had t minus 1 square plus so on plus alpha m, you had t minus m square plus eta t. So, we run regression here, then the number of lags m can be determined by the span of the data, say 4 for quarterly data or by any, you can use some information criterion also. You choose different lags and then you uh, try to find the appropriate number of lags using AIC or BIC. Then you apply the LM test which is actually your F test. You have fitted the multiple regression here. So, you get explained sum of square 
E s s which is the explained sum of square, you get the residual sum of square. So, your f ratio is explained sum of square minus residual sum of square divided by m. Then LM test of eagle in which we consider the arc model given here. Eta t is the other term, then we are interested in testing the hypothesis that alpha is equal to 0 for all i. Then in LM test, first we run some ARMA or other appropriate linear times these model and we estimate the residuals here. Then we square the residuals. Then we run the following secondary regression. We run the regression for these squared residuals. Again, the number of lags can be determined either using the span, span of the data or by using some information criterion like AIC or BIC. You try different values of M and then on the basis of AIC or BIC, you select the appropriate value of M. Then so you, ha you have run the regression, multiple regression in the previous step. So, your LM test is equivalent to this F test. So, your F ratio is you get explained sum of square while running the regression. So, explained sum of square minus you also get residual sum of square. So, minus residual sum of square divided by m and then you divide it by the residual sum of square divided by n minus 2 m minus 1 and under h naught this follows F distribution with m n minus 2 m minus 1 degrees of freedom and then you can form the critical region for testing this hypothesis. In time series modeling, it is not only the conditional mean of the process, but modeling the conditional variance of the process is also very important. Uh, of course, for the stationary time series, the variance of the process, the unconditional variance of the process is constant. But if you take the conditional variance of the process given the past observation, it may depend upon the magnitude of the past shocks and it may also depend upon the past variances. Usually in a time series, a big change whether in increasing direction or decreasing direction is followed by another big change. And such kind of behavior leads to clusters in variability of the process. And modeling such kind of clusters of such kind of behavior of the time series, such kind of volatile behavior of the time series is important in many fields like for financial time series analysts or for people who are uh, doing risk analysis for them, modeling such kind of behavior is very important. And uh, ARC and GARC models are developed keeping in view this kind of volatile behavior. In this lecture, I have considered ARC models. Uh, in the next lecture, I will discuss the GARC models for modeling this kind of volatile behavior. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.